Now I'll talk about the Drake Equation. <clears throat> years ago, many years ago, about 40 years ago, we started to think about the possibility of detecting extraterrestrial intelligent life. And we asked ourselves, how might we do this? And then, as now, the most promising way to detect extraterrestrial intelligent life was to detect its radio signals or television signals. Now, this generated interest in the subject, which has grown over the years into searches all over the world for extraterrestrial intelligent radio signals, television signals, and in recent times, even light signals. But to design a search, you, you need to have some idea of how difficult the search may be, how far you must look, uh, how long you must look, and even on what frequencies, channels, if you will, you might have to look. And so to get the answers to some of those questions, I invented an equation which gives an estimate, a very crude estimate, of the number of detectable civilizations in our galaxy. It takes into account the rate of star formation. The more stars you make, the more civilizations there will be. The fraction of those stars that actually have planets, something we have come to learn in recent years through dis discovery now of over 160 other planetary systems. Uh, how many potential life-bearing planets there might be in each system? We've learned that from our own system in the study of the newly discovered systems. What fraction of potential life-bearing planets actually give rise to life? It's very high. We know of many chemical pathways which lead to the presence of life as we know it. And there are probably pathways to, that lead to life as we don't know it, making life very common in the universe. We uh, need to know what fraction of that life will actually evolve an intelligent species. That's something we don't know very well, except the fossil record on Earth shows that the one thing that has always increased in size is the brain, suggesting that intelligence is inevitable in every world that has life. It may take a long time, many billions of years, but it will be there. And then there's the fraction of intelligent civilizations that use a technology we can detect. We have to take all those into account, and when we do, we conclude that about once per year in our galaxy, a new high technology using civilization appears. Some civilization we could detect. Well, how many are there? It depends on how long they continue to be detectable. And that's something we know the least about. We have been detectable for about 50 years. Uh, we will be detectable undoubtedly for at least another 50. Maybe it, our detectability goes on for thousands of years. And that suggests that civilizations remain detectable for thousands of years. And of course, all that's based on only one example, that of ourselves. And so we have to be very cautious that uh, this whole uh, calculation may be prejudiced because we're basing it on one known civilization, our own. But that's all we can do. In any case, what this all leads up to is the estimate that the number of the detectable civilizations in the galaxy is in the thousands. That's very exciting. There are thousands of civilizations to detect. But it doesn't mean the search is easy, because even with thousands, the distance to the nearest civilization is more than a thousand light years, and it means we must search perhaps tens of millions of stars before we will hit on one, which is transmitting to us in a detectable signal. And so that is where the equation has led us. It has told us life is out there, it can be found, but the search will be very demanding and very expensive and long. I'm Dave Summers. I work here at the SETI Institute. A lot of my work's over at the NASA Ames Research Center, and we're here talking with some people at the SETI, over, uh, SETI uh, Open House about meteorites. And what we have here is a iron nickel meteorite. And I'm going to have these, young, these gentlemen see how heavy it is. Yeah. And let's see her. And it's quite heavy, isn't it? It's nearly solid iron and nickel. And I'll explain why it's solid iron and nickel in just a minute. You can keep doing, uh, looking at that. Because I want to show you, and I don't know if this will show up on camera, but can you see these shiny bits of metal? Uh, looks like they're, they're metal that almost like they're machined. That is the interior of one of these meteorites that's been cut open. This thing, this meteorite that they're holding is nearly solid iron and nickel. If you, if you put a magnet on there, it would stick to it. 
Now, in fact, that's actually an uncommon kind of meteorite. What we have here is a stony meteorite. This is a more common type of meteorite. And this will be a good uh, introduction to the question of why these are so different. And in answer to a question one woman asked me, do we know how old they are? And the answer is, in fact, for almost all the meteorites, the, and the answer is that almost all meteorites are old. And we're talking 4 billion years old. Because the molten rock that they solidified out of cooled very quickly, because meteorites, by definition, come from small bodies, with some exceptions. We'll get to a moment. And what happened is the solar system formed out of little specks of minerals and ice, little dust and ice coming around the, uh, the, uh, in a big cloud. There was also hydrogen and helium, but that all went into, like, Jupiter and the sun, leaving these specks of ice and dust behind. In the outer solar system, they climb together and they form comets. That's why comets are big chunks of ice. And that's why people are interested to them. They're pretty much just all that stuff gently climbed together. And if you pull them apart, they think you find that stuff. Now, in the inner part of the solar system, all those specks of, of, of minerals lose the water and climb together to form these stony meteorites. All these little minerals were, were dust, some of that dust, that climbed together. And this is a lot like what your asteroids are like out in the asteroid belt and places like that. Well, if they get big enough, you form what they call planetesimals. And going from memory, I think we're talking like a 1,000 kilometers across. And what happens then is you get enough heat in the interior to melt it. Iron is, as you've been noticing, is heavy. And the iron all goes into the core. And those planetesimals collide with each other, get broken apart, and you form iron nickel meteorites. That one is from the uh, meteor crater in Arizona, and I'm told it landed about 40 million years ago and came in about 20 kilometers per second. Now, for reference, in 20 kilometers per second, it takes about two seconds to come in from outer space to hit the planet's surface. So how did, uh, my question is, if it's in the core of these planetoids, how does it get out? Are they erupt? They're like a thousand miles across, and another thousand mile in our body comes up, it smashes into it, okay. and it breaks up. And that's how they get yeah. released. Okay. It's basically a collision breaks the whole thing up. And of course, since they have to be pretty big to make, since they have to be pretty big to melt in the interior, that they be pretty big, smacked by a pretty big thing like that. And in fact, the Earth, the way the moon is thought to have been formed, is you had the Earth was a cretin. This is all happening when things are accreting onto each other. There's all sorts of things floating all over the solar system. It's just a chaotic mess. And the Earth was busily accreting stuff, and an object the size of Mars slammed into the Earth and blew off the material that the moon was formed from. And that's how the moon was formed. Now, I'll just finish up with one last, if you want to board, and that is, all right, I said almost all the meteorites are old. A while back, they came across a class of meteorites which were only about a billion years old. So about a billion years ago, there was lava someplace that had uh, crystallized to form these. Well, in fact, the asteroids were all cold and frozen solid four billion years ago. And that was a, a puzzle, as you were. They sort of thought they were from a planet, but they couldn't prove it. And one, then finally, the, Marsh, the Viking probe went to Mars and landed on the surface, sampled the air, they looked at the composition of certain aspects of that, of the atmosphere of Mars, and looked at the composition of certain inclusions in those meteorites, and they were a match. So that told them those meteorites came from Mars. And what happened was something had smashed into the planet, blown a bit of Mars off, and it landed on Earth. And those were some of the exceptions to all that.